Hello, everyone. Good evening. I'm Jeremy McCarter. I'm the director of the Public Forum. It's my pleasure. Thank you. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Joe's Pub at the Public Theater for the latest installment of our Public Forum series. I've, in the lobby, I saw some friends who have been coming to the forum all throughout our three years. It's lovely to see you again. I want to say a special welcome to our friends from Jazz at Lincoln Center, who are probably joining us for the first time tonight. I hope it's the beginning of a beautiful friendship. And I want to especially thank Mark Rosenthal, who I believe is here, uh, who, is a, who is a trustee of the Public Theater and is on the board of Jazz and Lincoln Center and found time in his busy schedule to play matchmaker for us tonight to make it possible for this to happen. Thank you very much, Mark. We're in your deck. If you haven't been in this building for a while, you'll notice it looks completely different. The lobby's new. The bathrooms are new, this stage is new, and a lot of what you see around you in the pub is new. This is a big year for the public theater. It's our rededication season. Uh, we are changing what we do to be even more open to the life of the city and to the communities that we're trying to serve. The public forum's contribution to the rededication has been a series that we call duets. They're one-on-one -on -one conversations that pair an artist who has been important to the life of the public with a leading voice from outside the world of the theater. The idea is that we will continue the public's mission of creating a dialogue between what's going on in the public, the work that happens on our stages, and the most pressing issues in the worlds of politics and culture and the media. So last fall, we concentrated on politics because of the election. It was not like a tough call. Uh, one of the programs we did on this stage was Rachel Maddow talking to Tony Kushner. They talked about politics. They talked about needlepoint. It was a fascinating conversation. This spring, we've been talking about music, how it affects our lives. We listen to it every day, but do we think about what it means and how it affects us? And I could not be happier about the two people who are taking part in tonight's duet to talk about some of these questions. I could go on and on with the introduction of the two of them about the Pulitzers that they've won, uh, the MacArthur Grant, the acclaim for composing and for being one of the greatest musicians alive. Uh, on and on, but you probably know those things, uh, and you don't want to hear any more from me anyway, you want to hear from them. So, please join me in welcoming to the stage Wynton Marsalis and Susan Laurie Parks. You brought your instruments. <laughs> oh, look, the people here. Uh, the, uh, oh, look at the people. Thank you for being here. Uh, the seed for this conversation tonight about music and about American identity and some of the ways that it affects us was planted four years ago. One of the greatest nights I've spent in a theater, to be honest. It wasn't a play, it wasn't a, a symphony, it was a talk, it was a lecture slash performance by Wynton Marsalis. It was called The Ballad of American Arts. <laughs> it was The Ballad of American Arts. It was at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., and it was about the ways that our culture, American culture, has been crucial to the life of the American people. Uh, I'm tempted to keep asking questions until you've had to recreate the entire thing for us tonight, but I'll start with one. You said that night that the Constitution gave us a way to resolve some of our differences, that it told us what to be, or I'm sorry, how to be, but it didn't tell us who to be. Right. For that, we needed the arts, we needed music. How has that happened? How, how has American music told us who to be? I think the one thing that, that, was, that was interesting, and it was that when I started to name songs and play them throughout the history of our our country people know the songs. So if I, if I talk about Go Down Moses, people know what Go Down Moses is. I talk about the Battle Hymn of the Republic, people know. Talk about Yankee Doodle Dandy, they know what that is. Talk, pick things from the American songbook, The Man I Love, people know what that is. So uh, the songs, the plays, the, the literature, the, the, the paintings, they have a, a fundamental an ethos, an ethic. And it is, it's in our people. We don't know it because we, we unfortunately don't really study ourselves, but it's like, it's like in, your, in your own life, you have to study yourself sometimes. 
right. you have to check yourself. Right, right. You said, uh, you said that the music told us we were all connected before, uh, before the DNA did. Right, that's when I, when I was talking about the minstrel show. Mm -hmm. You know, and I just ran down the progression of the minstrel show, which was some white people imitating some black people that they saw doing something who then imitated the white people imitating them because they were imitating the white people to begin with. <laughs> then professional white imitating blacks and then the blacks on the plantation being called to find the best and most talented of those who were then imitating the white professionals for the form and then the white professionals imitated after the uh, end of the Civil War, black professionals imitating white professionals. <laughs> one layer on top of another, and that's like an actual progression of the minstrel show, the songs, and the dance, and the, the way of playing music, and the, the root of all of our music is Anglo-Celtic music. What happened when Anglo-Celtic music met at different types of African and Caribbean music, and the music, Anglo-Celtic music is still the root of a lot of American music. That's why you have all the kind of Scottish, English, popular rock bands and singers come from across the way, it's because the root is Celtic, and of course you still have the, the Afro-American strain and the take on the, the strain, the take on the music. All these things are still, uh, they're not as educated as they once were, but they still are there. Do you hear it, Susan Laurie? I mean, when you listen to the, I know you listen to the blues, I know you listen to all kinds of music. Is there a, do you, There's a whole lot of Lincoln going on, I would say. Link, Lincoln the president, or Lincoln, Link, Lincoln the... <laughs> I mean, you wrote the play. Well, you're no, two but plays. you just said. I mean, yeah. that, but that's. I think that's why. You know, what you were saying, Whitney, is there's a whole lot of Lincoln going on, and you can hear it. I mean, both. You know, right. both, um, and you can you can hear it when you listen to. I mean, we were talking about. Oh, so we were talking about our our little. Because uh, sometimes, you, the only way to talk about it is to. Right. Right. So let's see if we can do this. So there's a song, um, um, The World on Fire, which some of you might know. Um, oh, darling mother, when the world's on fire, don't you want God's bosom to be your pillow? When the world's on fire, oh, rock of ages, Rock of Ages, be there for me. Which is, of course, this land is your land. This land is my land. From California to the New York Islands. Right, and then, this land is made for you and me. Right, which is, so there's that, there's that Lincoln, right? Thank you. <laughs> that was cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's the part where I laugh and giggle. Okay. Um, <laughs> but, but there's that, but yeah, yeah there's, that, there's that. So the, the World on Fire, for those of you who are as familiar with it, it's a Carter family song, right? You know, um, and um, it was a hit in like the 20s, 30s. And then, of course, Woody Guthrie comes along and gets so tired of hearing God Bless America that he writes this land is your land, to an established tune, which probably was something like the world on fire. And the idea of the world on fire is linked DNA or our American cousin to uh, this land is your land. And I was thinking of the fire next time. So right. we have a. Right. And if you, if you take just a way of playing the progression. That's what a musician is hearing. Right. So we're just listening to the progression itself. It could be like a New Orleans march. Right. It could be like many hymns. The chord progressions are the same. Same basic three. I, I hear you turning me up. I'll talk louder. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same basic three chords that are fundamental chords in Western music. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have the, the, one, the, the four chord, the one chord, and the five. So right. When I'm hearing it, right. and I'm, I mean, I know the song, of course, we all know it. People started to sing along with it. But in order to play on it, I'm just listening for. <laughs> so 
So that progression huh. just goes over and over again. Huh. As is the huh. way in American music, huh. we repeat those progressions over and over again, and we come uh -huh. up with different variations right. on them, and that's how we can play with each other and improvise. Oh. So that is the same in the 20s, 50s. It's the same right now. We do the same. We have the uh -huh. same practice. And it was also the same in the 19th century. Right. So it's that for 100, 200, 300, 400 years. Well, it's, it's just repetition of a form over and over again, and you do your thing on top of it. Dancers do it. Yeah. They're used to kind of repeating the same thing. The root of it, I think, is in English, like country dances and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Of course, mm -hmm. the Africans touch the music, and they put another thing on it. But men and women didn't really dance together in African music. Mm -hmm. So there was, there's a lot of uh, cross-pollination -poll going on. But huh. that itself is a fact. Is What else are people going to do? Huh. The question always is, what is the quality of it? Right. And do you think that there's, do you think there's something unique to this country that allowed that to happen here? Well, we all know that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to set you up. Is that too fat yeah. a softball down in the middle of the plate? I didn't mean it like that. Okay. <laughs> I didn't, I, no, I really, I didn't mean it disrespectfully okay. in any way. I really did. I just said it like, of course. I mean, you know, yeah. only everything about it. Huh. I mean, but what is? I mean, are, are we are we uh, more than anyone? Any? Are we more than other cultures? Um, the ones who do the repetition revision? Because if you say musicians do it and dancers do it, I know writers do it. I know I've made a whole career out of it. Like, mm -hmm. it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good, uh -huh. you know? Mm -hmm. um, are we, do we, do you think we do it more than, like, say, I don't know, other, pe uh, other people? Mm -hmm. um, in, in music, uh, I don't, in music, I think that, uh, like, like, there are forms like, like uh, flamenco music. Right or Indian music, ragas, right. where they repeat a form over and over again. But we're the ones who, who are the most successful at distilling that form so anybody can play on it. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. You know, bulerias, those kind of forms, if you're not from there, you're not gonna. Right, right. The blues, anybody. I've been in Turkey, had a guy come up on the bandstand in mm -hmm. Istanbul with an mm -hmm. instrument I couldn't even recognize. Huh. And huh. he said he wanted to play, and I, when he came up, I said, well, what are you gonna play? Right. What is that you playing? Right. He said, blues, man. <laughs> so we, you know, we started playing the blues, and he right. started. He sounded good. Wow, so, wow, wow, wow. You know, wow. I think we we figured out a way, kind of, to to negotiate those forms in such a way that we can all uh -huh. actually uh -huh. participate. Uh -huh. That's uh, very cool. Though. I it, love it. We've negotiated a way that we can all participate constitutionally, meaning not just the written document, but right. the way we are as Americans right. created, the way we have created ourselves. Right integral to that is an opportunity for us all to participate. Right, right. You know, uh, I mean, the, uh, it's exciting. <laughs> I'm happy. I feel good about America today. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that's it. I mean, when, you, when, when, when we talk about it in these terms, when we talk right. about the cultural heritage, you, I mean, you talk about the riches of cultural heritage yeah. that we've inherited. But the problem is that most people don't think of it that way. Right. That, I mean, you've talked right. about the neglect I mean, why is that? Why isn't it? I mean, when you talk about it, it's, it's this glorious thing that we all share, and yet, mm -hmm. I mean, what's, what's, why are we deaf to this about our heritage? I think a myriad of issues. Uh, yeah. One was the failure to address the achievement of the American Negro in the inception of the, of the, of the ideas. Like, the minstrel show was always, it's a minstrel show. So when that's your most popular form for 80 years, <laughs> That's right. what you did. Right. And then when you have forms like jazz, a lot of time was spent on the race of a person or, hmm. or, or, or condescending to the music. And Duke Ellington and Benny Goodman and all different musicians mm -hmm. were playing the whole time. So much time was spent condescending to them hmm. that that became the form of criticism. Hmm. When it came time to make that music a part of the education system, how are you going to make it be a part of education? Right. You spent all your time condescending to it. Right. So even in, in my lifetime, if, if you played in a jazz band, uh, the, the literature that you played was, you never played Duke Ellington's music, it was always something on the radio that wasn't that good. Mm -hmm. But if you were lucky enough to play in a youth orchestra, you were playing Ravel's music and Sibelius music and Mahler. And right. Even though you were a teenager and, and your orchestra sounded sad, right. still people, older people said, y'all need to play this music no matter how bad you sound. Huh. <laughs> in jazz, it was always, you know, a Parliament Funkadelic melody or medley or something just ridiculous. Right. And it's still that way uh, uh, around our country now, it's still a kind of battle to get the best of our literature in front of our kids so that they can be nourished by, by those achievements. Right. You talked in, in your book, um, Moving to Higher Ground, uh, that, and in fact in the ballad, 
that, that even you, with, with the growing up in a musical family and, and being surrounded by this music, even you were, were late to appreciate people like Armstrong, I Benny was, Goodman. I was in my neighborhood, you know, we didn't, Marvin Gaye, Stevie Wonder, I mean, you know, Afro, Black Power, right. yeah. not Hello Dolly. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the reality of that time. Even with my father, who was like the only person who probably knew really who Louis Armstrong was and who had played. Right, right. Man, you gotta check Pops out. Big Pops, man, yeah. come on, man. The handkerchief is too much. Right, right, right. But it never, mm -hmm. you know, listening mm -hmm. to him. So. Uh huh, uh huh. Right. But it's, it's hard to know what you have. I mean, if we, if America's really great at, you know, repetition and revision, which is like a form of, I don't know, recycling. It's like sustainability in a way. You know, you use what you got and you make it anew, like a quilter or something. Oh, a shout out to my mom, who's a quilter, who's here tonight. Hi, mom. Sorry. <laughs> 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 that was a part of, but I was just, hi. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> but I just, you know, the, if we're really good at that, a lot of times you don't recognize the junk around, you know, the junk. So, you know, the crap around your house that you can turn into something beautiful and new. Or, or people driving by you know, aren't going to notice it. But you go to places like Japan, and oh, they're crazy for the blues. Like, blues musicians are, wow, amazing. And here, I don't know, these people can't you know, piece their, their rent together. Um, I, and I, I, don't, I don't know why. It's, it, I guess you got to die and be dead for a certain number of years before people, <laughs> you know, I don't uh, know. Well, you, you also grew up around music. I mean, I uh, not the Marsalis family of jazz musicians, no. but... I wish. But, but, be your neighbor. But you, <laughs> you, don't, you don't be my neighbor. You know, I didn't want to be your neighbor? <laughs> no. oh. <laughs> we weren't playing music. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be like, oh my God. <laughs> Take me out of here. <laughs> uh, but, but you've talked about this. I mean, that you, uh, the kind well, of music, the music that you well, grew the up music in. we had... I mean, you can't contradict that because I'm going to make it. This is the made-up story, Mom. Um, the music we had, <laughs> it's like, check. Like, check. Um, my mom loves jazz, and we would go around the house dancing the jitterbug or trying to and singing all the, you know, from the jazz standards. And, you know, so that was Mom. And Dad, tall, six-foot-four Dad, loved opera big guy, um, career army officer, would walk around the house singing Puccini. Mm -hmm. And you're, I'm looking at him going, oh, you know, it's amazing, amazing. And you know, back then they had the reel-to-reel -reel and all that. <laughs> so we had these two, you know, forms, these two beautiful forms. Um, and as I told Jeremy earlier, I wanted to play the guitar when I was a kid. <clears throat> and back then they didn't have uh, Wikipedia or, or you know, the internet or anything. So I went to, I went to for a while a um, predominantly white high school and all my friends played the guitar, you know. So I wanted to play the guitar too, not because they played it, but just because I, you know, it was great. And I think I had seen, you know, or heard an Odetta record or something. I wanted to play the guitar and they said, well, you know, black people don't play the guitar. Now this is, this is, but this is, then there's no, imagine there's no Wikipedia, it's 1980 something, and you go, well, I don't know, there's Odetta and Jimi Hendrix, and they said, but who else? And you, and because you don't know, because of my own ignorance, I went, oh, well, I don't want to be inauthentic, I'll put it down. Now, all my favorite guitar players are like, you know, from Mississippi John Hurt to Reverend Gary Davis to Rosetta, to Sister Rosetta, Memphis Minnie, the list goes on and on. But I didn't know that then. And so I put it down. So it's so important for those of us who represent to... But I, I, like what you, I like what you... The beautiful thing about what you said is they're your favorite guitar players, but you didn't know it then. But they were also your favorites then, too. You just didn't know they were your favorites. And that goes... Uh, across our country, you know, whether it's a white person playing guitar or black, right. people can play or they can't play. Right. Right. And I think musicians, basically a great violinist, Mark O'Connor and I talk about that uh -huh. all the time. Because uh -huh. I'd heard about him when I was in high school. Man, uh -huh. this a dude. Play. In New Orleans, we talk like that. Man, it's a dude in up somewhere, man, a white dude playing violin. He wins all the fiddle contests, bro. Wow. You got to hear him play. Wow. Wow. So when I finally met him, I'd heard about him for years. This is the guy they're talking about this, winning the national fiddle contest every year. 
And we start talking about like there's a mutual heritage in music. Right. So just in what you said, it's like the beauty of it. Right. Just it was there. Right. And you felt it. So when you heard it, you could embrace all of the people you heard. And, and, and like, because yeah. they were in the ones that the kids you would listen to, too. Yeah, I get it. In, in, through the groundwater, though. You know what I mean? They didn't but, know they were listening to. But that's. To, that. Yeah, I know. Right. You know, it's like Eric Clapton told me that he mm. was somewhere in the middle of nowhere and heard people playing blues and said, man, I want to play like them. Huh. And I said, man, I was in the middle of Kenner, Louisiana somewhere, and somebody gave me a record of Maurice Andre playing classical music. Huh. And I read that he, his parents were coal miners. And I said, well, if they're coal miners, I know I can learn how to play this too. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, my, my, my kind of ignorance right. of the music was just for socially, I was coal yeah. miners. Yeah, yeah, and when yeah. I heard him play, I was like, ooh, I want to play like him. Yeah, but that's so great. We see someone or hear of someone who is somehow like us, and we feel, I can do that too. Right. So it's so important, I think, for, because, you know, you, I know you meet young people, people coming up all the time who look at you and go, there, there he is, I can do that too, and that connection that is made, uh, that bridge that, that just suddenly appears out of nowhere, a possibility from that young person to their future, you know, it's cool. So I just, I, let me just, I just want to ask you one question about, oh, yes. if you're listening to your father singing a certain style of music and your mama's singing in, in a certain style, having a certain thing, I know your mama is playful, because when I met her, she was playing with me, I didn't even know her. <laughs> I, I walked in and saw her, she started acting like I knew her forever. <laughs> So I started, I started wondering, do I know her? She was like, ah, I said, okay. <laughs> Wait, so, you know, I know just to be with somebody that playful, and I mean, just I saw y'all relationship, kind of the love and the feeling, yeah. how y'all were joking and messing with each other. I love that. And so did you, did you absorb two different things about styles of music through their different personalities? Like, did you equate a thing about a style of music to kind of your mama's personality and daddy's personality, or did you just put it all together? I think I just put it all, I think I put it all together because it's like a wave, you know, it's like those sound waves and the truth like meets in the middle, you know what I mean? So it wasn't ever just this and just, it's like it goes zzz, 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 like that. And I've met in the, you know, in the middle right there. I mean, I am the middle child. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it came like, I was like, yeah. Um, so I got it from one ear to the other ear, you know? So you think theatricality, but the, the swirl is, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Beautiful. Mm -hmm. the, uh, you, you mentioned about the uh, children and, and it's not an abstract question for either of you. I mean, you're both parents. Yes. I wonder, as am I now, so this is more, it's not an abstract <laughs> question for me either anymore. But what do you, but what, do you, have you thought about it? I mean, you must have. I mean, you're, you're, your kids are older, but what, what kind of relationship do you want, do you want them to have? Yeah. Is it up to them, or, is it, or, or do you feel you, you need to teach them certain about things? About music? Yeah, do you, I mean, Durham is six. I got him, you know, uh, he, he does this. He walks around, does this. And then he goes, ah. <laughs> so he's got the two basic components. <laughs> Performance applause. <laughs> you know, so I'm, you know, I'm just doing stuff. And I you know, started playing the accordion and the mandolin. So I just do stuff around him and see, um, you know, hopefully he'll, he'll pick up something. Oh, he will. Oh, he will here. pick it up. I don't know. How to, how, but how to, are your, do, your, are, do your children play? I never. You know, I, I wanted my kids to be in the arts, not so much like uh, force them to be in music. My daddy didn't force me to be into music. But for me, I teach so many kids and I'm always around kids that I think the first thing is just that they feel that love and that, that feeling. The first, the love you have of whatever thing you like and the love you have for them, not like they are something for you to achieve. They're an achievement. They're there and they do their thing. So I like to play with mine too and mess with them. And I think that just the repetition of things over time. Mm -hmm. If you want kids to remember, you have to repeat. Mm -hmm. Like that Sunday that you went out for ice cream with your mm -hmm. uncle or something, you know. I mean, I can never even remember being with my mama almost one time ever alone because there's so many kids. And, mm -hmm. But I find it just repetition. If you want, you play things. If you want kids to play, listen to them play. If you want them to talk about serious things, talk about serious things with them and listen to what they're saying. Mm -hmm. When they formulate that, and then just through time, they feel that the love drives it. So even when you're arguing and fighting with them, and, and because you have that type of depth of love, they're teaching you too. Like I can remember distinct things my sons told me to teach me. My one son, my middle son told me one time, hey man, can we just not talk about something? <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, because I'm trying to always, man, you need to think about this, or this is such and such, he's like, 
and you know, on and on. I mean, I, I, I could go through like a thousand things of just a, my, my middle son, my, my oldest son, I would be in a cab and uh, I, I, would, I would be talking messed up to the cab driver or something. Maybe he was eight or nine and he would go, <laughs> is, is that your humanity? <laughs> and you know, it would be all things that they had seen me do. Or just my, 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 my youngest son, my, 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 my third son, he's, he's here tonight. And I have something called a great leave, which if you're not on time, I just leave you because I'm always late. <laughs> so, so he stood up and told us a long story about something he went through in school, very clear ideas about level of quality, the Black Student Union, and how the, pre the, the school was choosing entertainment over education. It needed to be an educational institution, and he was upset by what they did. And you know, he was saying, so I was, I was pontificating to him about writing the letter and all that. He was half listening to me, patronizing me. <laughs> so all the while, I was getting ready. So, when I got ready, I got my man James driving me. He'd been driving, I've been knowing him since 25 years or something. So I said, come on, James, let's leave him. James was in my house. We eating. We left. And then he came out the street. We had to go around the block. So he called. He said, where y'all at? I said, well, we're on 17th Street, but we, we're going, man. We left you. So he, so he ran down the street and caught us on 18th Street and said, you can't leave me, man. So now he's here. So I got to watch myself with him. <laughs> you know? But I mean, he always says that I should have a cartoon or something on me or I like to just play around and mess with them <laughs> and, and, and joke, because you got to have fun. I mean, that's all what you're going to remember, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Repetition, I mean, repetition is, is, is a hallmark of the music we've been talking about, but it's also a hallmark of your writing, Susan Laurie. I mean, the idea that themes recur from play to play or within a play is, is, is um, it's sort of... It's a habit that's hard to polish. This isn't working, but it's a habit that's... It's a habit. Yeah, but is there? But you, you've said this. Uh, I don't know if you wrote it or if you just said it uh, around me, and I just loved it and I said it. But you actually think of your that this is. There's not for you the, the writing that you do, and music that you play when you take your guitar and you play gigs sometimes. Right. That you think of your plays as. Operas without music, right? Which is a fascinating way to think about a piece of dramatic literature. Is it? I don't know. Absolutely. Well, but I mean, how did you arrive at that? I mean, this is. Yeah, it just made sense. It just, it just makes, it just made, it, it, it made sense to me. The people are singing. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, I wish I had a great, you know, the, I mean, they're yeah. singing, you know, the, 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 um, the, the structure is, is, it's architectural. It's, you know, epic and mythic and you know, glorious. It's not, you know, it's not very intellectual. It's very, you know, like, I mean, like the, it's a combination of like the operas, my dad, you know, my dad loved Puccini. I mean, you know, Puccini is, I don't know, it's, I, I would say Puccini is deep, but he also ain't deep. You know what I'm saying? It's like yeah. butterfly, butterfly, dun, 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 ah! you know, it's like, you know, <laughs> sorry. I mean, you know, all, pre but you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like, it, it's kind of, you know, what it is. And, you know, my plays are very much like that. They're just, um, but they're, I can hear the, 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 anyway. Mm. <laughs> do you, do you lay, you lay your form, how do you lay your forms out? Like, do you, you, you write, write an outline? How do you form like a? I do, I know I do write an outline, but we can't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I do. I, I sort of walk around and I go, what's the story? What's the story? What's the story? Like that. What's the story? What's the story? I don't, and I tell my, uh, my students, because at, uh, at, uh, I teach over at NYU, I tell them the same thing. I don't think about the theme or the message or anything like that. I just think about the story. What's the story? Here's a guy who wants to, you know, like my new play, Father Comes Home for the Wars. He has to go to war, but he doesn't want to. His master says if he goes to war, he'll be granted his freedom. What does he do? You know, obviously he's going to be fighting for the wrong side. You know, mm -hmm. what does he do? What does he do? You know, and what that's the story. So I just think of the story, and I draw maybe a little sketch or put it on some cards or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you how do you compose? Oh, is it too complicated a question? Yeah, no. How do you write? No, you it's write? it's interesting, kind of what you're saying about the the language. Is like the you learn how to speak through the song of the language. Like a baby's bab babbling, they're trying to figure out the song. So even with the words, like real beautiful phrases and things that you, when you're going through them, you want them to sound a certain way, it's the song right. and the rhythm of it, the rhythm of the words and also the harmony with other things. It's exactly like music. 
you have characters, they're talking to each other, what point do I want this person to do this? When do I want them to do that? That's all music. When is something going to happen? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And with long pieces of music, like, I mean, the Supreme Master, of course, Beethoven. Right. Just how Beethoven takes a theme, and he's just waiting, he's waiting, he's waiting, boom, and then he hits you with another thing. He's like, oh, right. look at that, then <laughs> I'll take that away from you. Right. But later, right. Listen, right. If somebody in the middle of something, very, very serious piece, it'll be something that's very funny. Right. Or something, very deep subject matter will be followed by things that are very fundamental, like what you right. said, okay? Yeah, it's right. very, very serious, but it's right. not. Right. And when you, Duke Ellington's also master of that. Uh -huh. He gives you something that you might have heard somebody on the, on the street singing some little ditty, do 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 it'd be like 15 different harmonizations of it. So, right. you know, for me, I, I write, if it's, if it's a really long piece, or if it's real, something that seriously takes a lot of architecture, I write it out, and I write it out, and I write it out, and I work on it, and I work on it, I work on just the form. Right. What keys I want to go in, what, uh, what parts do I want to play, who do I want to right. do what where, and when I start to write it, I change it. Uh -huh. But I got to kind of know from the beginning to the end where I'm going, because the <laughs> forces, if it's a big piece with a lot of instruments playing, there's so many forces that I got to, you know what I mean, what is the bassoon going to do? Right, right, like, what is, right, right. I mean, you know, it's just a lot of calculation on the kind of bigger pieces right. that. It's like a rope, you know, if you've ever gone, you know, caving or anything, you know, spelunking, they give you that yellow rope, you know, I feel like this, that yellow rope. You're, in the cave, you got your yellow rope, mm -hmm. you know, um, so you're not going to get lost underground or right. anything, you know. Or if you do, you got your yellow rope. Right. <laughs> yeah, that yellow rope is important. For me, that's like the melody. Like, I might write if a right. piece is, is, if a piece is two hours long, I'll write out a two hour melody. Huh. So I'll write the whole melody. I'll have a notebook that would just be a melody with nothing else to it. Because huh. I want to know what that through line is. Then I just start to put in stuff around it. That's so, you know, I'm sure the, the through line. That's, See, a, that's, that's the same. That's so cool. I like that that's high so voice. Great. No, I, I, I love the high voice. No, I love that. <laughs> that like signifies, man, what's wrong with you, man? That's your high voice. You get into that. I'm talking to you. No, that's you know, the that's, voice of that. I love it comes that. From yeah. there. No, but it constitutionally, constitutionally, we are set up so that we can participate with each other. Isn't that cool? Right. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> You wrote, when you wrote about, uh, I think it was in Moving to Higher Ground, you wrote about a moment of discovery you had uh, with uh, Coltrane, listening to Coltrane, and the way it was a story. The, the, it's sort of something, you, you, you had a revelation listening to him and realizing that beneath the virtuosity, there's something else that you were listening for all that time. Well, it wasn't so much the virtuosity, because I, I grew up around the music and the musicians, and they could play. I mean, my daddy could play. Nat Parallax could play. James Black could play. They could all play. And they had a picture of them with Coltrane. Mm -hmm. And they loved Coltrane a certain way. And they would say, man, that's us when Train came to New Orleans in 1963. It's a picture mm -hmm. of us with Train. Mm -hmm. So it's like Train was here, you know. <laughs> now you got to realize they're living in like Opelousas, Brobridge, Little Farms, Louisiana, their country. And they're teaching their kind of black high schools and their band directors. And they're trying to figure out how we're going to feed our families and stuff. They got kids and they, they're struggling. People don't really want to hear that kind of music. And uh, I didn't really like, I liked them. I liked hanging with the musicians. I was always in the clubs with my daddy and them. There was never a lot of people there. But it was always kind of an adult vibe that I liked. Mm -hmm. And then when I was, the summer I was 12, I, and I was listening to whatever was popular. Parliament, Stevie Wonder, Earth, Wind and Fire at that time. They were just getting popular. And then some kind of way, my brother, we had all of my daddy's records on the ground mm -hmm. and all of ours. And I looked down at his records and I said, man, I asked my brother, man, you notice how daddy's records the people look intelligent and they look stupid on all of us. <laughs> <laughs> and it was really, it was really only like an honest visual. I mean, we had like the Ohio players, <laughs> honey, you know, and we had Parliament, Funkadelic, he was coming out the mothership, and we had something else with people with all of their stuff on it. Was, so it was really just ironically, you know, so because I hadn't hooked up like the whole kind of generations and cold train and past the future and all that. I was just <laughs> I said, man, I'm, so I noticed the Cold Train record. I noticed Miles Davis someday, my prince will come because the lady was fine on the, on the album, but she wasn't dressed all crazy and outlandish. Right, right, right. And I, I noticed Duke Ellington, and then I, passed, I said, I'm going to put the Cold Train record on. So I put that Cold Train record on. It was Giant Steps. I didn't really like it. But I said, I'm going to keep putting on Cold Train's records till I like it. <laughs> <laughs> so I would put Train on. Every day I would come on. I said, let me put Train on. I put right. Train on. Then I start one day, I said, Cousin Mary, boop, wee, do. Then it's like I could hear what he was. Unlike like our music, it was, it was, it was the artifact was pretty. Right, right. It's fun. Right. 
but his music, he's telling you something. Right. And then I could kind of hear, okay, this man is, right. is something in here, what he's saying to, yeah. you know, then I start trying to turn my, my friends on to, man, y'all got to check out this cold train. <laughs> They'd be like, no, man. <laughs> but, but you don't think like the song Flashlight is telling you anything? <laughs> not, not only did I not think it was telling me none, I played it every night for about two years. <laughs> so whatever it had to tell me after that first year, boom, 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 neon light. Yeah, right, 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 right. It wasn't telling me nothing. <laughs> it was funny, it was loud. After a while, my ears would hurt going near a bandstand. I told the guys in my band, man, when I stop playing this, right. I'm not ever going to play this again. Right. <laughs> and another thing from just playing, and trumpet players, we generally could go out on the slow dances to make the rest of the band jealous. Right. There's like 10 people in the band. We're playing funk gigs every night. Take us an hour, 10 people setting up the equipment. Right. <laughs> in one hour, that's how loud we play. 10 people working for one solid hour is a lot of noise. But just after playing that every night, I told my brother, right. man, I got to learn how to play, because if I end up doing this, I might commit suicide. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I got to be honest about my feelings. It's not a popular stance, but it was earned. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a stance to come from being at home right. philosophizing about right. it. It came from neon light, flashlight. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's got to okay. get some light under, under the, the sun. sun. Yeah, we under got the to sun. do that. I mean, come on, that's we cool. do, yes, we do. We got to get some light. <laughs> that's the, we, we need some light under the sun. <laughs> we got to get that. I'm hearing some effect for the song. I don't know what you're saying about it. I, don't know, I had a good time on the song, but yeah. I didn't want to play. You know what I mean? Just the yeah. thought that you're going to be growing to being a, a, mm. a man, and that's what you're going to be playing. No disrespect to George. Right, right. I just felt like, man, you know, what about what Coltrane is playing? Mm -hmm. Why nobody don't want to hear Coltrane? Mm -hmm. right. And I told my brother once on a bandstand, right. we're playing some really stupid song, much worse than Flashlight. I said, <laughs> man, he was 16, I was 15. I said, man, it can't get too much stupider than that, than this, <laughs> what we're playing. And my brother right. looked at me and said, man, it can uh -huh. and it will. <laughs> <laughs> Me and him laugh about that all the time. <laughs> you know, I actually remember the dance. Oh, said it can, and you got to admit, it's real loud what wow. we play. It can, and it will. Wow. <laughs> and he was right. So, uh, one of the people that we, uh, one of the people that that you both intersected with in different ways, or at least the, the someone's music, George Gershwin. I mean, Susan Laurie, you were just, I was. You just spent a couple years I with the music of George by the Gershwin. Gershwin Estate. <laughs> no, no, I was, yeah, they, um, they brought me on to, uh, I, I, I'd love to use the word now, amend, that's my new word, because I like the Constitution, Porgy and Bess has been amended, and, um, and everybody's like happier for it, I think everybody is happier for it, and, um, but they brought me on to, to work on uh, the, you know, the uh, new version of Porgy and Bess, and it was glorious to be in that world of that music for two whole years yeah. you know and just just the beauty of the music and and um the the beautiful thing that they the, the original work that they created is absolutely beautiful so it's a joy this is i mean there's you know porgy has this sort of complicated history going <coughs> back to the 30s uh, and where it gets where it's always been the fight about the gershwins and the fact that they were writing about a culture that was in some ways, remote from their own. Right. If it was somehow like appropriating musical materials that they didn't have a right to use. Musical right. and, 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 and lyrical, I mean both. Right. Did you have to, was that a hurdle you had to clear? Did you feel, did, were you creeped out about the idea of, of? No, no, I wasn't creeped out at all. I was yeah. so thrilled that the, the Gershwin estate wanted to amend, like the Constitution, you know, we go, oh, gee, we have to add something or, or you know, or, you know, amend it in some way because it's not yet everything we want it to be. And so 75 years old, they want to amend this, this classic and they call me in, which is kind of great, really, um, that they would, you know, they, they would call somebody in who's like, yeah, let's go, like that. <laughs> um, and, uh, but he, he, right, my high voice. And <laughs> <laughs> No, no, you uh, wasn't in the high voice no, then. <laughs> no, but, but you know, they, they called me in and that I was, I was thrilled. And you know, I, I was not familiar with Porgy and Bess um, because 
when I was growing up, you know, they had the movie on, you know, the late, 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 late show. And, you know, I watched, I remember as a child watching like five minutes of it and then going, ooh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you turn it off. So that's all I had seen. I was not familiar with it really at all, except, of course, you know, a few of the songs that were, you know, jazz standards that I listened to and loved. Um, so even though it was an opera, this was not something that my mom sang and my dad sang. We, we didn't really have much exposure to it. And when I listened to it for the first time, when Diane Paulus at, from ART sent me the, the CDs and whatnot, I did fall in love with it. I fell in love with the music. And then I just said, so the book, we're going to rise to the occasion. Hmm. And that was my charge. Right. Have, you played, have you played the score? Have you played the Porgy songs? Yeah, I mean, yeah. played them, listened to them. A lot of them, some of them, they're not really the ones that are the most popular ones to, to play. Most of the jazz musicians have played them. Yeah. I guess at this point, you must have played everything the song book forwards and backwards. <laughs> no, I wish. Actually, I wish I had. Yeah, I need to play them. What's the, I mean, what's still out there at this point? You, you, um, anything you don't know is out there. Yeah? There's a lot out there. Yeah? There's always a lot out there. You know, when you, when you learn some new material, it's new to you. And, uh, so far as people feeling like a person cannot appropriate other people's material or you have to be from a culture, George Gershwin is from the same culture as the material he's appropriating. So you shouldn't play a trumpet. Or you shouldn't use a progression that's on in, a, in an English hymn because it was in an English hymn. Mm -hmm. The question is always what do you do with the material, not where it comes from. Mm -hmm. You want to be so adroit and it, with the material that it sounds like you came up with. It. Mm -hmm. There's not that much you can come up with. You, you reorder things in your way. It's like DNA. Yeah. There's this great anecdote uh, DuBose Hayward tells, a story he tells, about when George Gershwin went to South Carolina. It's this famous episode when he spent three months there doing research, trying to, to absorb the musical culture that he was supposed to be channeling when he wrote these songs. And they went one night to some kind of musical performance. I can't remember if it was a religious thing or if it was just a sort of community thing. And... And Hayward said Gershwin kind of lit up and immediately understood the music that was going on. And he said for, him, for watching Gershwin that for him it, it was more of a homecoming than an exploration. The music that he was listening to is more of soil music, Western music. I bet you he wouldn't have felt that if he'd have been listening to Gagaku music. Mm. Also music from another culture, he'd have been, what are they playing? I've been in concerts like of South Indian music where our people start clapping. I would just look around like, well, why are they clapping? <laughs> and my friend, an Indian musician would say, you don't hear that? Huh. No. Huh. What are they playing? In the West, you know, Western music, we all come from a certain route. So yeah, he could hear the music. And he also could write songs, yeah. which in itself is the first the achievement, to have the ability to write a song. And how many composers throughout the world have gone somewhere to be around some people who are singing songs that they're trying to figure out how to learn their songs. Bartok went to places he, in his own country. He didn't know what they were doing. And listened to them sing and tape recorded it and studied it and came back and wrote his version of something to give him. So was he not entitled to appropriate that material? On and on and on. I mean, that's, that, Duke Ellington did the same thing. When he went around the world and listened to people's musics, he studied their musics and he appropriated things in their music to put in his. Was he not entitled to appropriate their music and use it the way he could do it. We get to listen. Bach I say, did it. I say like, oh, I want to talk about Bach. Because you say Bach. But, I, but, I, but, but I'd say yes, yes, yes. And, and still, I think sometimes, in some situations, it does matter who tells the story. It does, it does matter. Because, not because we're all not entitled and we're not all American, we don't all understand it, but because the playing field isn't level and because the door of opportunity doesn't open the same way for everybody. So while somebody, and maybe in, you know, I'm thinking like Hollywood or in TV or the, you know, the film and TV industry, where s some kind of writers might be given access to get some things made, other writers are not given the same access. So in a way it does matter who's, who writes the story because, because the playing field isn't level. And until the playing field is level, we just have to acknowledge that it's not, yeah. you know. I just, you know, but I that doesn't right, mean that everybody know, doesn't understand. have the right to look at things and appreciate them and write about them, you know. Right. Definitely I understand not. that, but I, I feel that, 
Okay. That's, that's August Wilson and I used to argue about yeah. this. Okay, so I have to kind of. No, I feel it. There's a there's a certain when you when your material gets to a, gets beneath a certain level or above a certain level, right. it can plug into like a socket. Right. If it's beneath a certain level, it plugs in everything that's around it. Right. So you're gonna get that job in Hollywood anyway. Right. Right. And if you don't want your material to be that way, that and the, the alternative is to not use who whoever it is wants to use. They just won't do it. Right. So it's not like there's anyone who can determine who writes about a thing anyway. Right. But if there were, right. the alternative would just be we're not writing that. Or we, you know, we're just gonna take this restaurant down. None of us are gonna eat. Right. Because there are things in our mythology, the mythology of our country, that it has to be a certain level of quality. We'll have mm -hmm. to change it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question of opportunity is very different from mm -hmm. the question of what you do as a writer. Right, exactly. Like, you can write what you want, and nobody has to ever hear it. Right. And that's kind of always my frame of reference because I grew up seeing my father play what he wanted to play. Right. Nobody came. Mm -hmm. There was never nothing glorious about it in terms of recognition. It was always eight people, ten people in a club at night, two people. I saw him once play one person who was drunk. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I saw that. So, you know, my, my yeah. thought always about art in general is you do what you, if that's what you're hearing, do that. Right. Right. So you may you be popular doing it or you might not be famous. And the thing that right. he taught me just watching him, not by talking to me, mm -hmm. just watching him is this what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> you know, so I'm coming more from that which is not to say, you know, about the opportunities. Having a lot of friends who are actors, mm -hmm. yeah, they're, you know, what, what mm -hmm. roles do they have? Right. But I feel like the more, it's, 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 a, it's an interesting issue. Like, I, I don't know that, well, in, in either case, you can't control it. Right. In either case, right. You, right. nothing we say or do is gonna make some people in Hollywood no. call somebody. Music is worse. Yeah, I, Trust yeah. me. Music is worse. Oh really? my God. <laughs> worse, worse than Hollywood. Uh, man, you can't Ooh. imagine it. I, I guess I can't. What? I can't. Uh, I mean, it's just, wow. it's not possible to express like the level that the music actually is on most of the time. But you can, what you comment on, like, not just even the words, just like the drum machines, constant repetition of stuff, lack of harmonic sophistication, not trying to connect to what our actual culture tradition, lack of melodic development, non, it's painful because then you always seem like a curmudge, you know? So, <laughs> so you gotta always end up just smiling and being, yeah, right. you know, okay. Right. <laughs> but I think, but I think that's, that's, what, that's what we do. I think you take, you know, a pause for the cause and acknowledge that the playing field is not level and then you go on and do what right. you gotta do. I agree with you know, that. it's like that and that's all I'm saying right. because I, I think it, it would be kind of dishonest that. to pretend like everything was, you know, da, da, da. I agree with that completely. But, you know, we just acknowledge it right. and then we go on and do whatever we're going to do. You know, right. And that cool. could also be for somebody with ability. There's mm -hmm. not only racial. Right. Cuz to exactly. clarify, mm -hmm. it could be mm -hmm. a person that wants to do something that has ability and it's just right. hey, we don't want to hear that from you. Right. <laughs> so right, exactly. Change what you're saying to mm -hmm. something we want to hear from you. Exactly. Or we can go out and get a drink. But right. We, right. That's <laughs> right. no, true. That's true. Uh, you, uh, when you had an album a few years ago from *A Temptation to the Penitentiary*, <laughs> where, where <laughs> <laughs> that says it all. Yeah, right, right. right. <laughs> but but where but where it's clear that this is that that, the, that these things bother you enough yeah. that, that they're on your mind enough that you you you're, you need mm. feel the need the impulse to express those things. The music. They stay on my mind. Yeah. Because I notice all the prisons that are are out here and I know all these issues. I grew up in a neighborhood and I know the guys I grew up with, they don't have a chance mm -hmm. to compete. I know that. Mm -hmm. I grew up with them. I know who they are and what they are about. I've been in enough schools around our country. I know that the schools are largely segregated. Mm -hmm. I know it. I'm not speaking from Lincoln Center or somewhere else where I look out a window and, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. I know that. So yeah, I speak about it. I talk about it. I've been talking about it for years. Not just in the form of protesting, which is okay, but in the form of actually getting in schools, teaching, mm -hmm. talking about it, because it goes, bo it goes both ways, you know, it's not just white versus black. It's like white and black versus white. Mm -hmm. So it's, mm -hmm. it's not only about even white and black people, it's about people. Mm -hmm. I remember the first time I was in, a, in Japan, I was talking to somebody, a Japanese friend, he said, yeah, you know, we, don't, we, we hate Koreans. Mm -hmm. I said, 
It reminds me when I was in elementary school, when they first right. started to integrate black people, we had to be integrated because Martin Luther King got killed. It was rough, man. Because it's like the South. You know, people had never been around yeah. black people, and you're going from, and you're segregated, and you're dealing with them, and it, you had a hard time. But I remember one girl came to school that wasn't just an absolute cracker like most of the rest of the people. And I asked her, well, why are you not ignorant like the rest of the kids? She said, oh, we, I'm from Mo Montana. We hate Indians there. <laughs> So I don't, you know, I don't, I, I am, you know, I, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm very much, and I never have shirked from it. I'm a brother. I grew up with brothers, an Afro-American. I'm not against nobody. I'm not against uh, pe pe white people. I, I've talked in, to black kids all over the country, give them a sense of the country we're living in. Mm -hmm. And that you, to be segregated, to segregate yourself is not the position, but you got to understand that, uh, it, we still got a, we, we got a long ways to go in terms of, because we have that long legacy, but we also have a legacy of achievement against that. Let's not let that achievement be cast aside only for the degradation. Because right. right. that achievement is something real, and in my lifetime, believe me, I've seen a long, long, right. we, we used to sing a song in our band, right. I'm we, we used to sing a spiritual, we, we do it as a joke, except that we say, we done come a mighty long way, but we got a long way. Ooh, we might sing that for 15 or 20 minutes. <laughs> we start singing and chanting on top of it and shouting. Yeah. And that's kind of how I feel about our, 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 mm -hmm. our country as a whole. I don't have that rose-colored glasses and, oh, yeah, we all drinking. Oh, no, we not. <laughs> we not. We not. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you what I've seen. I'm not speaking from no book. Yeah. Right. Uh, you know what I mean? Well, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm with it. you. Right, yeah. So uh, uh, I'm curious about culture and our president, Barack Obama. <laughs> I felt like there's a, this is a sort of slightly wild theory, but oh. you can tell me if you think it's totally oh. baseless, uh -oh. that one of the reasons why the United States is willing to elect Barack Obama in 2008 mm -hmm. is because we have the kind of culture that you described. I mean, to hear the ballad, I think it was a couple of weeks after his inauguration, it felt very soon, I think it was like mm -hmm. February of 2009, maybe? Could that be? So, uh, but, but it feels to me like uh, he, he said, lots of people said when Barack Obama was elected that only in America could something like this happen. And I didn't know what that, or at least I thought it was worth thinking through because he's a citizen. Citizens can get elected in all sorts of democracies. Right. But what they're saying is there's something about this country that made it possible for someone who was, who had his background Someone named Barack Hussein Obama could, could win states that had formerly been red. And I thought, how is that possible? So what, what are people saying? What are we really saying when we say that only in the United States of America could something like that happen? And maybe it's because I was writing about culture at the time, but what I thought was, <coughs> it's partly because we've had this cultural tradition. The cultural heritage that you wrote about is one of the reasons that, that like prepared us mentally, spiritually, to do that. Now you can tell me that's completely crazy, no. if you like. I don't know why. We, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I would, I, I agree with what you're saying, but I, I think there's something deeply strange about the American psyche, and I think that it. I mean, and, and beautiful. What I mean is rich and strange. You know, Shakespeare, and Shakespearean, gorgeous, and possible and, excuse my language, fucked up. You know what I mean? I mean, deeply, deeply. As beautiful, you know, we, we are, we reach as high and we dig down as low. And as far as I know, that's what I mean, we are, and because we are American, and that is to me what it means to be American, these high-reaching, low-grubbing people. Um, and in that space, which is an enormity, that possibility was allowed to happen. It's a poem. It's a beautiful poem. His ascension. Uh, and it's, a, it's like a beautiful Shakespearean play, you know? Well, what you were saying about Beethoven and the way that the funny things Bach. arrive in the middle of the serious things also sounded exactly like Shakespeare. It's something Bach, that, Bach. that we. But that, but, but that's something that we know. I mean, why do we do Shakespeare? You know, in this Shakespeare in the Park. One of the reasons why his writing endures is because he managed to capture all of that, all mm -hmm. the joy and all the sadness mm -hmm. and everything else in his writing. Fuck. 
Well, I think that um, there's a strain of absurdity in our culture. And w let's say when you get in a political situation that's as polarized as we are, mm -hmm. you're robbed of your voice. Mm -hmm. Because if you make, if you, when you're on a side, you have to be on that side. Mm -hmm. Because if you're not on that side, you then give power to the other side. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to discuss the president mm -hmm. for, for a black person mm -hmm. to discuss the president. Mm -hmm. Because if you give 99% of your vote to someone who very seldom mentions you, if you say something about it, then you're giving power to the other side. They want you to basically, their social agenda is basically a confederate narrative. So you, you, that the confederate narrative robs you of your opinion because there's no way in the world you're going to go to that side. You can't do it. It's like a person out on parole that some people are committing crimes against. <laughs> what is he going to do? You're going to fight them? You're going to end up in jail. So uh, the situation we're in from a political standpoint robs you of your ability to express an opinion and be honest. Mm -hmm. So you just smile. Mm -hmm. That's what you do. Uh, we, uh, we, uh, <laughs> you know it. You know what I'm just saying? Everybody knows it, they just don't mm -hmm. say it. Mm -hmm. what? what is there to say, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Don't say my name, it's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not here. Right. But that's a, you know, yeah. I'm only here as a poor person. Is there, is there a way that music helps us through this division? No. Really? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, no. Like I called my, my boy Herlin Riley when people were in the Superdome. We from New Orleans, my partner, drummer, unbelievable mm. trumpet player, he was down there. Mm. I said, hey, bro, mm. do they need some music? He said, this ain't time for music, mm. bro. <laughs> <laughs> he said, if you got some bread and some water you can send down there, mm -hmm. this is the time for that. Mm -hmm. We could get to the music later. Mm -hmm. No, it's mm -hmm. not about music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just not. Uh, what does, well, I'm curious, though. So it's not music. It, it's not writing. I mean, really. But what does get us through, you this think? Because we got to just right. be active. Action, mm -hmm. saying what we think, being for real, mm -hmm. stepping out, mm -hmm. being active, getting mm -hmm. out. We gotta be for real. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we wanted to leave a little time at the end for your questions. Uh, we <coughs> have two people from the public in the audience with Ooh. microphones. There's one, I believe someone else is in the back. Mm. Uh, we just ask that because there's so many of you and so few of them to please just keep it as short can as you multiply. can. Uh, no opening statements, no follow-up questions. Just, uh, just take your best shot. Uh, so if you would just raise your hand and someone will find you with a microphone. It's a little tough to see out there, so I think I Pearl is just uh, on, on you. Go ahead. Okay, I'll stand up. I'm gonna try to keep this short. Hi. It was about this point about American music being constituted in a way that it could reach everybody and everybody could participate worldwide. And I was wondering how does that compare or, or how does the reach of America affect that? Because the American economy, the American military goes all around the world and that spreads the culture. So how do those things come together? Plus the fact that the blues comes from people living the blues. And I guess everybody live in the blues. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. So how do those factors come in? And everybody don't have to keep living the blues. We can do something about that. In fact, I'm working on it. Uh, <laughs> and talk okay. to me about this later. But I wanted you to get into that. I don't know. You have music and I don't know. You're talking about the, the reach of the country itself. That doesn't mean you're going to like some people's music. I mean, it's... At this point, we all listen to a lot of different music. Like somebody like Bob Marley is interesting. Mm. His music became very popular all over the world. It's because of his music. The country itself didn't have that much. Jamaica does not have fantastic reach, but his music mm -hmm. all over Africa, India, Japan, Europe, America, his music, people heard it and they, it was charismatic and they mm -hmm. could feel it. So I think it's more the artifact itself. Johann Bach, I tend to just say. If you listen to his music, I didn't like it when I first heard it, but when I heard it, I said, well, 
I don't know what that is, but whoever that is is not like everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> that's, you know, that's exactly the same thought I had when I heard Charlie Parker. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I don't like what he's playing, but whoever he is, uh -huh. it's not two or three of them. <laughs> <laughs> that's one person. And, you know, uh -huh. so it's just, I think. But you, I, you, think I mean, you. You've no. played all over the world. Do you feel, have. have you, I mean, uh, do, do I different have. cultures react in different ways to the music that you play? They, they, you know, my experience has been that people like the music. Mm -hmm. They like the soul, they like those chants, they like, that. I, I find mm -hmm. that when I was playing more music, it was like a musicians like it, but the people would be like, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. When we start playing the New Orleans music and the grooves mm -hmm. and the counterpoint mm -hmm. and the 2B grooves mm -hmm. and the call and response mm -hmm. and the, Showers and stuff that came from the church and all the stuff we grew up with. Huh. People all over the world said, ah, you might, get a, you might not get a good review for this, but we love what you're playing. <laughs> you know, and I would never play down to them. It was never like, you know, you got to sit there for a couple hours and listen to it. But they would be like, ah. And when you go into people's homes, when you meet with people, when you teach kids, when you do, if you got the basic good manners that you have Southern kind of basic soul and feeling, yes, ma'am, yes, sir. oh, they all oh, come back. Mm -hmm come back, you, you not only do y'all sound good, y'all are not a drag. Right, right. It's just all, so I find people love our music and they love us. Yeah. They yeah. do. I could tell you stuff that, have, I've been outside of, I mean, I could just, if I could just tell you, I've been in places where, I remember just being in a, a neighborhood outside of Istanbul and all the people were saying I was Michael Jackson back then because they didn't know <laughs> black American, Michael Jackson, you know, Michael. Wow. Wow. Somebody wow. named Michael. Wow. <laughs> And they start talking, and one lady's daughter was learning how to speak English, and she wanted to come down and said, we're musicians at the Zildjian yeah. factory, brought us some Turkish oh, sure. coffee, start talking. You know what I mean? People embrace you. Japanese wow. people, it's everywhere in the world. It's like soul. But it's, it's like our art allows us to export you know, the best that we have. You know what I mean? So you think of the military and the, the crap that we're sending out there. But our art is this beautiful, our music, our literature, our, you know, our blues, that's part of the beautiful thing that we as America have to offer. And all the other stuff sort of mm. is there too. But, but it's something that I'm very proud of that, you know, I, I go around the world and meet people and a lot of them, you know, it's literature and a lot of them don't s speak English as their first language, but they understand what's going on in some of these plays that are sometimes very American. They understand 365 days, 365 plays. They get excited. They helped us produce the whole thing around the world that year when we did it in places like Burma where, you know, they don't have much, but such a spirit they have and such excitement, you know, and they feel like it's American what I'm bringing to them when actually it's just the spirit, you know. It's not American, but we seem to do it very well. <laughs> we in this country seem to do that spirit thing very well, so. The people wanna like you. Yeah. They wanna like this country. Yeah. <laughs> they really do. We've been hurting them in the last few years. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, they want, cause I mean, I've known so many people so well from so many years of being on right. the road, being in their homes, sitting up, talking right. with them, arguing. Some people's homes I might've been in every year for the last 20 years. So I'm really close with a lot of mm. people who are in foreign countries. And they'll be like, we want to like y'all, but right. y'all are killing us. Right. <laughs> right. Right. You know, right. we want to like you. We'll have real frank conversations. Yeah. Damn, we want to yeah. embrace y'all, yeah. but y'all. Yeah. Wow. So we wow. just, I think, one thing I think Barack Obama did a lot to help us in terms of just people, boy, before he got elected, people truly hated us. Right. Right. Then they just went to a low grade of dislike. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he helped us with that. Huh? Uh, is there a question somewhere in the back, maybe? Someone, someone have a mic? Oh, you have a mic. But anyway, I have a question. I mean, you know, we, we've extended and, and introduced the world to our music, but how do we bring that back home and get our own people interested in music, and particularly in schools, public schools around the country. I grew up in Philadelphia. I went to public school where we had a very rich music program. But that seems to have been cut, you know, and just pretty much disappeared from many schools around the country. What can we do to bring that back? Like Each one teach one. You know, there's, there's slogans for this. We've invented the wheel in the movement, you know, right? 
We've got the slogans. We've got the ways to do it. Each one, teach one. That's, you know, if, and I think, you know, I, so I sit down with, with my son and I play the guitar, you know, with him, for him. You know what I mean? He's my little project. Okay, maybe all parents can't do that, but if we thought it was our responsibility, you know, because we can't get the funding back in the schools necessarily. Um, if you play an instrument, I would say volunteer your services to go into the schools and do what you can or your friends, you know. Maybe it has to be more grassroots than, you know, some order from the, the higher ups in the executive office. You know, well, I, you know that, that's the type of activism always is important, but I think that uh, many times we talk about the schools, mm -hmm. we haven't really been in the schools. Mm -hmm. Once there was a kind of racial divestment from the schools, Right. First time the music started to get taken out of schools was the first depression. Mm -hmm. So you had that whole wave had nothing to do, right. just people didn't have money. They took arts out, mm -hmm. curriculum. Mm -hmm. That time a lot of people played pianos, music, but then that continued through through the nineteen then we had World War Two. People started to resegregate along certain lines, a lot of suburban schools, urban mm -hmm. schools. We started to get this new terminology, a new America. Then the music changed. Then you had Sputnik and the whole kind of math and science and the Russians are beating us. That was the next wave of we don't need to know anything about our arts. We need to figure out how we can compete with people in math and science. We still are doing that except now instead of the Russians, people we're afraid of now, it's the Chinese people studying all over China. Right. <laughs> and we, we're not studying enough. Right. Now, our schools, by and large, so far as I can tell for the thousands that I've been in, are largely segregated. So it's like the two integrated public schools in general. Hmm. Mm. Those schools, the worst of those schools is not something you can imagine. You didn't teach nobody music. I can say in 50 to 60 percent of schools I went in, I might have came to teach music, but I didn't teach any music. I just taught yeah. sit in the room and be quiet. Or just, yeah. Yeah. It seems funny, but that's something to know if you can't do it. Okay, I can write a play on that. Like yeah. the, who is the vice principal? Who is yeah. the two black? Yeah men they happen to find who could possibly be in the school, mm -hmm. what the kids are doing, what the level of conversation is, what the music is they listen to, how they deal with each other, on and on and on. It's not something, when we talk about the schools, we don't imagine that scenario because we don't know it. It's a national problem that could, it is not as difficult to solve as we think, but it is impossible to solve without national involvement. So if it doesn't include jobs programs, if it doesn't include all the things, because a school cannot be a, a psych, psych, give psychological counseling to 35 kids. A teacher cannot do it. Yeah. It's just not possible. So if people say, oh, the teachers, it is, you know, it's, it's a mere best, but it's really like a national problem that we as a nation have got to embrace and say, at a certain point, we have to put something back into something that we always took out of. Right. You're not going to be able to send everybody to jail. It's not possible. Mm -hmm. And until that point, But while we're waiting, I mean, that's the thing, because right. I get frustrated, you know, while we are waiting for the people in power to wake the hell up, you know? Might we, what, what might we do while we are waiting for that to happen? Right, and we have a lot of, a lot of, a lot of organizations, like our organization, yeah. Jazz Lincoln Center, we, we're gonna do 140 concerts right. in the New York City Public Schools this year. Wow. Right. We do a lot of teaching, I mean, just, but, but we, we, we are not alone by any stretch of right. imagination. When I'm traveling around the country, I see a person with a band of kids, mm -hmm. a person with their, we drove 70 miles with these 60 kids to right. see y'all play to give them. So right. there are people all over the country who are, we just have to start to demand another level of involvement and engagement with all of our kids and not with just those who, who, can, mm -hmm. who, can, who can pay, or if we have the means to pay for things. Right, right. Uh, question in the back, whoever's got the mic, Farima. Someone go ahead, we can't hi. see. Yes, hi. hi. Um, I have a question about um, American music and racial identity. I mean, I grew up a, a white kid in the 60s, my father worked on 125th Street in Harlem, and sort of the, the choice that Witten discussed between his father's music and the more popular black music at the time, and for, for me it was the choice between Motown sound and the Barbara Streisand that my father listened to. And I went right to Motown, and it, it's defined my musical tastes ever since. And over the last half a dozen years, I've been drawn to New Orleans because of the music there and the primarily black musicians who play there. 
and since Witten brought him up, I had the great privilege to speak recently with Hurl and Riley during a trip when I was down there. He and I had a long conversation at a cafe right next door to a club where Witten's father plays off in Snug Harbor. And I, and I said to Hurlin, or I asked Hurlin, I said, you know, <clears throat> you, you play in New Orleans, you play at, at Lincoln Center, you, you, you play to crowds around the world, but primarily you are a group of black musicians playing mostly to white audiences. And, you know, and he said to me, well, what would you like a brother to do? You know, and, and, and when I asked him, well, where are the black faces in the clubs in New Orleans? He pointed to the other types of music available to them, to the, to the funk and the R&B and the, and the rap and such. And I, I guess maybe this has been a long, circuitous way of asking Winton, how important is it that young black people are educated in jazz music and, uh, um, you know, as part of a racial identity? Or is it adequate that they find um, their identity, they choose their musical preference and go forward from there. Well, <laughs> your question. <laughs> you said Gwen. Uh, well, <laughs> I think the first thing is that uh, the, the identity of the musicians and of the music, like my father was in, in the heart of segregation, he was always the most integrated person I knew. Like he would listen to Ella Fitzgerald and Barbara Streisand. He listened to Bill Evans and Wynton Kelly. He listened to Duke Ellington and Benny Goodman. Like he, he was very eclectic in his taste and in, 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 in his embrace. He used to always say, y'all want to go back to segregation? or You want to recreate what we had? You, you got to move in the, and it wasn't in a kind of Uncle Tomish way of, you know, we got this. Dizzy Gillespie once told me, he said, man, the music was about integration. So I think that's the first thing. And in terms of our kids and the black, black American kids and the kind of segregated education we have, we have so many challenges at this point just with, with fundamentals. Yeah, I think the arts, the thing that I really think would, would, would help us and help American kids in general, not because you know the, the, the suburban schools and the white schools, they have more re funds, but they have, a, they have a lot of problems too. Uh, the thing that I think with, with the national movement that we need is a swing dance movement. Because the root of a lot of problems is male female. Like when you start to exploit that kind of relationship, you're exploiting a 12 or 13 year old, you're making money off of them, you, you, you're giving that type of trash to them. And I'm from New Orleans, so it's never something that shocked me. Like, can you believe they said bitch? Or can you believe, <laughs> of course, they, we've been saying that forever. But I, that you could make money off of it in, a, in, a, in your country, and that could become your popular music, and that your kids could actually, that's their diet. Man, that's a rough diet to give somebody. I don't know that they're going to come back from that. Mm -hmm. So swing dancing teaches like a certain type of respect. And it doesn't preach to you. It's active. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a give and a take. Mm -hmm. You have to listen to music that has development. You learn how to respond to it physically. So my hope for our country, the movement I look at all the time that I think could be successful teaching us, this is after years of teaching music now. And mm -hmm. because I feel that if we could get back to that dance, because the dance is a, and if you ever go to a high school dance, my, 16, my, my son is 24 now. When he was 16, he said, man, you got to come to this dance with me. <laughs> so I, I came to the dance with him. And it was like, you know, okay. It was, much, it was on a much lower level than what we used to do. Mm -hmm. And I played th thousands of dances in high school. He said, the deep thing about the dance wasn't the ignorance of what we were dancing. You see what the people your age were doing? He said, they were wishing they were out there. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like it's been a collective kind of breakdown, and we maybe don't know that. Like, right. I mean, I don't, I just feel like the dance is, mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah, and I don't separate the black and the white so much because even the white groups of people that you see are very, it's, it's an elite group of people who follow the arts, who get into the music, who keep the culture going. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's a national, question of national identity at this mm -hmm. point. But our kids, yeah, they need to know a lot more about, about the arts, all of our kids. I, but I, I, I would say that, I, I don't know if I think mm -hmm. that certain kids need to you know, learn and embrace certain musical forms on certain instruments. But I would like all American people to be more knowledgeable about what we've done already, where we've come from, you know, to, so that we can walk around while we're right. making whatever kind of music we're making or writing whatever kind of things we're writing and be proud of, because right. before me came so-and-so and she or he did such and such. 
And to know that, there's a kind of wonderful pride, which, I love, I love you know, that, that comes saying. from yeah, that. So. Right. And to have pride in something great. Right, mm -hmm. right, exactly. Like to actually have pride. I mean, right. I'm proud of Winslow Homer. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm proud of George Gershon. I am. Yeah. You know, I was proud of him when I was in high school mm -hmm. and played Rhapsody in Blue in the mm -hmm. original orchestration. I said, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know you, George Gershwin. He, we got somebody mm -hmm. here, too. Mm -hmm. Proud of mm -hmm. Aaron Copeland. Mm -hmm. You know, you, I, you, you want to be proud of something great, and the right. pride is the right. Right. You right. know, I've never actually heard it expressed that right. way or used it. Oh. But I'm going to put that in my lexicon because that's yeah, true. <laughs> because that pride is important. I mean, yeah. it makes you feel like you can do mm -hmm. something and you're a part of something mm -hmm. great. You're a part of something great. That's right. Uh, that, I feel like, is the perfect note to end on. Uh, um, I want to thank you both. I want to thank you for coming. Um, and I just want to say, um, if you look, uh, one of the parts of this renovation, this wonderful renovation we've had in the building, uh, is that there's now up on the mezzanine a, uh, called the library. It's a restaurant and a lounge. And I think you'll each be getting a little discount if you'd like to take advantage. If you'd like to go upstairs and continue the conversation, have a nightcap, whatever you like, it's up there for your enjoyment. Thank you again for coming. Have a good night.